ladies and gentlemen i'm raja sampathi and welcome to let's take two uh with calm corporate a show where i talk to leaders in the business world leading not just with their intellect but also with their hearts and what we can learn from them to live a more meaningful professional and personal life my first guest is uh david siegel uh ceo of meetup the world's leading platform for making connections and finding community and is in the forefront of fighting the loneliness epidemic. I met three of my closest friends here in Austin through the Austin, Texas Scotch Meetup group. Uh, I even attended a meetup yesterday. Uh, David is also the author of the bestseller, Decide and Conquer, 44 Decisions That Will Make or Break All Leaders, which details his decision framework he used when he took over as the CEO of Meetup when it was acquired by WeWork and how he then led its successful sale from WeWork. Whether you are leading an organization or not, I highly recommend the book to anyone working in the corporate world as there is a lot to learn from it. Prior to joining Meetup, David was the CEO of Investopedia, another company I love. Uh, and David is also a professor at the Columbia University. David, welcome to the show. It's great to be here. Wow, oh, you just came from a meetup yesterday. I love it. And you met all these people through Meetup. You're Mr. Meetup. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, like I said, three of my closest friends to Meetup. I mean, it's 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 amazing. So amazing. We'll, we'll try to we'll try to host you, uh, whether you drink scotch or not. Try to come to the Austin. I meetup. do drink scotch. Glenn Levitt is my go-to. So right. you know, I like the single malt. Oh, beautiful! Beautiful. Let's 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 make sure we're connected, and next time we'll get you to one of our uh, events here in Austin. At the Austin. Amazing. Meetup. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you, David. Uh, let's get into the questions. So in your book, right, uh, your top rule is be kind, okay? So this blew my mind, right? You're a business leader. Uh, it's not about revenue. It's not about top line growth, EBITDA, da, 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 strategy, whatever. It's be kind. That's your first rule for leaders. So. Tell us a little more how that got inculcated in your life and how does one go about being kind and work? Yeah, okay. Uh, maybe I'll start with my, my background. So when I was younger, I was quite shy and I'm a big extrovert right now and pretty confident person. But I remember when I was, you know, 10, 12 years old, I was shy, I lacked confidence, and people weren't kind to me. Um, some people were, you know, my friends, but I was bullied as, as a kid. Um, people call me like negative nicknames, and I, you know, I, I had challenges in, you know, terms of that, that, that kind of experience in my, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade times of my life. So I think that really has a defining impact on you when you're when you're younger and people aren't kind to you and you just say like I'm not going to be like that kind of person. I'm going to be a kind person. And so I'll start so that's I think impacted me. You know, there are other people that have never gone through those kinds of things and they don't it's harder for them to have as much empathy for when people aren't kind and when people are surrounded by people that aren't just nice or good people. And the thing that I found and it's, it's it's surprising because people look at you know the Jeff Bezos says the Elon Musks the people who would not be described as like kind per se We're like look at how successful he is. look at Steve Jobs he's so successful he's not kind so that's the way you succeed but the reason why being kind is good business is because the job of a leader is to attract amazing people to want to work with them to want to work for them to want to work for each other and to build an amazing leadership team around you. Well, the people who are going to want you're going to want to attract don't want to work for a not a, an asshole, a not a good person. So being kind enables you to surround yourself by people who want to work for you from one job to another. Like one of the things I'm most proud about is I have one executive. This is his third company he's working me with. A CTL this is also his third company. Where most many different people, this is their second or third company they've worked with me, and because we have a kind relationship. And and last thing I'll say on this is. There's also a big difference, though, between being kind and being nice. And the goal is not to, quote unquote, be nice, because it's not nice to have to fire someone. It's not nice to say to someone, 
the thing I know that you want to work on for your career is not actually important to the company, so I can't have you work on that. It's nice to say, work on whatever you want. And, you know, you know it's not nice not to give someone a, a compensation increase for whatever reason. But sometimes the kindest thing you could do is to tell someone, this place is not necessarily working for you, out for you. So don't be a not nice per don't be a not kind person, but don't necessarily think that you have to be, you know, say nice things to every single person. Sometimes the best thing you could do and the kindest thing is to, you know, tell someone that something's not working out and give them that critical feedback. And that's what real friends do. So being kind is just good business. Beautiful. Being kind is good business. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so following up on that, you know, talking about firing people. So you joined Meetup at an interesting time, so as to say. Uh, you had to lay off, uh, you know, 25% of your staff or so in the first few months itself. And, and from the book, I know that you did it in a, such a way that it caused as, I mean, getting laid off is terrible. I've been there twice, but as least anxiety as possible. So right. talk about, you know, empathy and leadership. Yeah. Um, I mean, empathy is the, there's a difference between empathy and sympathy, right? Empathy is your ability to truly understand what it's like to be in someone's shoes. And early in my career, I was an early employee at a company called DoubleClick in 1998, 1999, it ultimately got acquired by Google for a few billion dollars. And they had a giant round of lists. I remember I had to fire once because I was working in human resources. I had to fire 30 people in one day, one day, just myself. And, and, I, and, and I think when you have early career experiences where you have to let people go or you've been let go yourself in not necessarily nice ways. And I've been, I've been let go twice in my career of like the eight different places that I've worked at. You also develop more empathy for how to do things the wrong way and how to do things the right way. So by having the experience of gone through it myself, you're able to be more empathetic. And that's because the benefit of, of kind of time and working for a long time. So what I did at Meetup is a, two, a few things, but one of them is you have to recognize that you have two constituencies if you have a layoff. One is the people that you let go. Two is the people that are still there. They're still at the company and dealing with the people that have been let go. And you have to have real important strategies and being kind for each of those constituencies. So the people who are let go, we did a bunch of things. So number one is we created an Excel Google Sheet with over 200 different contacts of C-level executives, of CEOs, of heads of recruiting, of search firms that anyone should be able to contact. And we put our names next to each of those different contacts and said, hey, if you're interested in such and such, any of these companies, here's a, here's a, a list of people that you know are hiring, that you know are looking to help you to find your next role. And people are like, wow, who creates that? Thank you. Um, the other thing that we did, which I've never seen done before, is uh, a friend of mine runs a, um, a big tech consultancy. And what she said is every single person that you let go, I'm gonna guarantee that I will interview this person, no matter what role they're in. And we actually had staff from there at, at Meetup that day. And we said to anyone, if you would like to immediately meet with someone and immediately get your foot in the door and not feel like you don't know anyone, there's someone here that would be happy to meet with you. And if you're not in the, in the mindset for like a real interview, you can at least shake their hand and you, and you could you know, find a time to talk later on as well. And I think people appreciate that. And then for the people who, who are still at the company, there's a grieving process because they lost some, you know, lost. They, they don't, they're not, their colleagues aren't their colleagues anymore. And you have to recognize that and we, and, 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 and do a lot of Q and A with them and answer their questions and help them to help the people who have left and comfort them and, and be transparent with them about what we did and why we did it and the financial impact of doing so. So it's just something you need to be really, really mindful about and that's an example where being kind is so, 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 so important because I think leaders are judged by how they act during times of crisis more though than any other time. And that's a time of crisis. So that's oftentimes how people are judged. Lovely, lovely. 
Well, I've been, like I said, laid off twice, but I've never been dealt with so humanely, uh, you know, by any of the former companies. Uh, so yeah, I think I think some of the employees even came back. I mean, they were the laid off employees came and told you that this this was wonderfully done, even though I mean, I'm, I'm being I mean, it was crazy. I had two employees who were let go that gave me hugs afterwards and said, "You did this the right way." And another employee sent me an email saying, "Thank you so much because I really wasn't happy, but I couldn't get up and." take action this helped me to realize that and to take action and all the introductions you made i've now had three interviews from those introductions so it, you know it's amazing and that that pays dividends it's just it's just very important things to do and people hear those stories and um, they want to work for a company like that and, and it helps absolutely absolutely so uh, following up, following up on the layoffs, David. So when it happened the first time, you personally felt it was not deep enough, and uh, uh, your prescience was right because you had further layoffs. But when you were asked the first time about it, uh, you said, "Yeah, it's done." And then you actually have the courage and the vulnerability to admit that, "Hey, I was wrong at that time," and based on that multiple times later you've been super forthright with your employees and making sure you know a decision of acquisition or whatever doesn't get leaked from the press they need to hear it from you first and there are other examples so tell us uh the importance of being honest in this business world it's a rare quality yeah i mean transparency is probably one of the most um important aspects to being an effective leader um the reason why is because transparency drives trust. And when you have trust by the people on your team, you really have everything because so many different actions could be perceived, good actions could be perceived negatively, and everyone looks at things through their own, little, own lenses. And if they trust you, they're like, you know what, I know David did this, but I know there must be a reason for why he did this. Um, or I know David did this. There must let's let's find out. You know what, what happened and what was done. So to talk about the example that you gave, when I when we had our first layoff, I saw the fear in so many people's eyes, and I just wanted to be nice, actually, mm. and not kind but nice, and to make people less stressed, less fearful. And someone said, "Are we done?" And I said, "We are done." And then nine months later, we had to have a no lift because. We were owned by WeWork at the time, and we were losing close to $20 million a year. We lost close to $40 million over a two-year span. We're now a profitable cash flow, cash flow and EBITDA profitable business. Um, and I, I didn't want us to continue to lose tremendous amounts of money. But at the time, I wanted us to be done. I should have said, however, my goal is to be done. Our ambition is to be done, not we are done. And then when someone called me out on it nine months later, I said, like you said, you are right. That was an enormous mistake. I should not have said that. I should not have misled you. And I think it's very, very important to admit mistakes and not to pretend like you're infallible. Every leader is fallible. And I think the best thing you could do is just admit that when you made a mistake, because that also drives trust. And sometimes you build more trust in the mistakes that you make and the failures you have and the things you did wrong than building trust and just doing everything, you know, incredibly amazingly and having people think you're just the greatest thing in the world. Nice, thank you. Uh, okay, so this question is <laughs> my favorite. Uh, I've been wanting to ask. I'm you. ready. I'm nervous, I'm but I'm ready. This, this is this is this has always been something that I have struggled with uh, in my corporate career, well, former corporate career. So, Meetup, a uh, WeWork, was uh, run by the mercurial Adam Newman, right? Yep. So you join as the CEO, and then you say that for three months you don't want to talk to Adam, right? Uh, so that's pretty cool, but uh, there's one more incident that was awesome where Adam calls you and is like, uh, hey, get on a flight with me from New York to San Francisco. It's a private jet tonight. It's a, it's a six hour flight and we're going to be discussing business. And you say no. Okay. So how does one effectively set boundaries in this yeah. place, you know, without 
the best case, sounding off like a jerk or, or an ass. Yeah. First of all, I think it's okay if you're afraid of sounding like a jerk or, or, or whatever, do it in the right way. Meaning, don't say yes to something because you're afraid of how you'll be perceived. Say yes because it's the right thing to ultimately do. And people will respect that decision. Um, it's incredibly important for leaders to say no. To say no for things that they need to take care of themselves personally and for say no to things that are really in the best interest of the company. I knew that Adam is an erratic leader. He's an opinionated person. And I knew that any time that I spend with him and him spending time on Meetup would result in him coming up with what we should do and him telling me, because he's also a very directive leader. He's not really as much of an empowering leader. He would say, David, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, and come back to me next month. And then I'd be, I wouldn't want to do those things because they may not make sense. And then I'd be constantly in this defensive position. So my general philosophy was, avoid 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 and um it worked in the first three months i made kind of an agreement that he couldn't contact me he couldn't follow up with me i needed to figure out meetup strategy first i need to be in the driver's seat as a leader to tell him what we're doing not to have him tell me what we're doing and then ultimately always be in the defensive about like why we didn't do a a b or c because his suggestions you know were so great because i've done that mistake i've done i made the mistake of listening to people who told me what to do and they were wrong and then you could lose your job because of that. And they don't necessarily remember that they're the ones that told you what to do. So ultimately you're hired not to just be a robot. You're hired because you have a past experience and your capabilities. And um, I knew that they respected me from my past experience. So I remember one time Adam called me up. I was like there for a month and a half. And he goes, this is Adam who, you know, is extremely aggressive personality. He goes, I know I'm not allowed to call or speak to you right now, but I just have a quick question. I was like, wow, he really gets it. You know, that worked. And then after three months again, he wanted to meet with me. And, and the problem with the, the plane incident that you, were, that you referenced was he wanted to, first of all, I had a doctor appointment for my kid at that time. So I didn't want to cancel a doctor's appointment. That to me, kids and family is more important to me than work. So that's my priority. And, and two, he wanted to meet, you know, at like one o'clock in the morning to seven o'clock in the morning because he's a real night owl, as you might have seen from We Crashed or whatever. I don't function after midnight. Like it doesn't work. So it would have just been like a total disaster. Me falling asleep, me trying to drink coffee, like him telling us me what the strategy is. It just would have really been not a positive experience. And sometimes when you know it's not going to work out, the best thing you could do is just not be part of that conversation in the first place, which is what I chose to do. It didn't ingratiate myself to him. I don't think he was happy about it, but ultimately it's made me up better, which is what my goal is. My goal is not to have someone like me. My goal is to be successful in the company. And that's it. And you know what? That, that's, and, and as long as you say my goal is just meet up to succeed, Everything else is secondary, including, you know, someone's perception of me. Nice. So the context of the boundaries is, is pretty important where it comes from versus just, you know, saying no for the sake of saying no. Exactly. 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 The why. Yeah. Yeah. So talk, talking about families, right? Um, one thing that you did, I think, with Meetup uh, was being sold away from we work is you know multiple negotiation processes and stuff like that so in between that process you decided to visit your son in israel yep you just spoke about family so i was very joyed to you know read that i was like wow he actually prioritized family so many times we miss that so what advice do you have people who are like so you know stuck with work and don't think of anything else yeah i mean you just have to ask yourself are you a person that works to live your goal is to work to live or is your goal to live to work like i'm not living to work i'm working to live and the most important thing in my living is my wife and my children and that's it so when people said well, during this crazy negotiation i'm working 80 hours a week like everything is is very intense during the sale process and people said, oh, you're obviously canceling your trip to Israel. I'm like, no, my oldest son is doing a gap year to Israel. 
I, I work hard in order to be able to take care of myself and our family. And I'm not deprioritizing that. And when I went to Israel, it's not like I, I, I maybe took a call or two calls a day and, and that was fine. Um, it didn't really disrupt our trip at all. Um, but, but, but I would say, you know, it's very easy to push things off. Oh, in five years from now and 10 years from now, I'm going to be less busy and I can spend more time with my family, more time with my wife, more time for myself. But you know what? Five years pass, 10 years pass, and you're still busy. You're possibly even busier. All you have now is kids that don't know their father's father or mother or, you know, their significant other as well. And life is short. So you want to make sure you're, you're putting your time around the people who love and care about you the most. And um, that's always been my priority. And, and I think weekends are sacred and they shouldn't be spent working unless it's an extreme situation. Well, I hope our listeners, you know, take a lot away from that. So the importance of family and the community too, right? So uh, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You want to tell us a little bit about the importance of community, just backing up on the family, because you were raised in an Orthodox Jewish yeah. world, which placed so much importance to community. And how does that show up in your leadership, in your uh, functioning? As a, a great question, Raj. So, I mean, so much of people's leadership philosophies are shaped by their younger years and how they grew up. You know, it, it's, it's really quite amazing to reflect upon. But, you know, growing up, if someone, God forbid, were to pass away, um, in our community, they would not, they would have meals set for them for one week, two weeks, three weeks. Everyone would just bring over meals, someone would coordinate, bring over meals. So in times of sorrow, their community was there to support them. And then times of joy and happiness and, you know, celebration, the community was there to prop it up even better and make it even more joyful to celebrate, you know, the people that mean the most to you. And 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 doesn't have to be religion. It could be any kind of community. It could be a running community. It could be any kind of anything that's meaningful for you. For me, it happened to have been something related to to religion. And and I've always wanted that in my life. And I've always seen people who don't have that community for themselves, and the loneliness that happens. And we mentioned it earlier, but. You know, 46% of people regularly, not sometimes, not occasionally, but regularly feel lonely. And that's just like a terrifying number. And among people who are Gen Zers, people who are, you know, in the 18 to 24 age group in the U.S. specifically, 62% of people regularly feel lonely. And it's just terrifying numbers. And, 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 and the, the number of people that are just have anxiety around social situations only increased with COVID. So I think the goal of community is to meet people that you may never have met before, meet people who are different than you, meet people who are different socioeconomically than you, people who are different ages than you. I mean, ageism is such a rampant problem. People who are in their 20s or 30s, you know, don't respect sometimes people in their 60s, 70s, and vice versa. People in the 50s, 60s, and 70s look down upon people in their 20s and they generalize. And it's just serious problems. And the reason for that is they don't have enough exposure. They don't have relationships with them. They're not really meeting them. They just kind of have very superficial type conversations. Well, in a community, you don't have those superficialities. You can have deep, meaningful conversations with people who are different than you. And then when people are different than you, ignorance decreases. When ignorance decreases, xenophobia decreases, and people's ability to meet people and learn from people is better. So like community drives, you know, so much positivity in the world. Um, it's, it's a great thing to devote myself and my career to. I'm very lucky. Great, great, great. And when you were just mentioning that, you know, there's a lot of similarities between the Jewish community and the Indian Hindu uh, upbringing that I had in India, you know, absolutely the same thing. It's, yeah. Well, I'll tell you, my best friend in the world is someone named Vib, Vibhav Prasad. Uh -huh. And, you know, he's from India. And we, we were friends together in business school. And, you know, we talk every week for the last 15 plus years. And I've gone on vacations, just the two of us together. And there's, there's definitely a lot of um, meaningful similarities in terms of family, in terms of education focus, um, in terms of kind of those types, uh, those types of priorities. Um, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I have many, many, many uh, amazing, amazing Indian friends. And, uh, you know, I'm so lucky to learn from them. Yeah, 
There's also an interesting connection, by the way, between India and Israel, which um, which is pretty special as well from a technology standpoint. There's a lot of incredible innovation in both countries too. Yeah, yeah. And there was India had a, not, not a significant, but also had a decent Jewish population before the creation of Israel. Wow. They all. You know, moved from like Kerala, Bombay to you know the current Israel. So. There is for over over uh, over two thousand years. There was a community called the Bnei Israel community, um, and it's an incredibly fascinating history. I've I've actually studied it quite a bit. Um, it, it's 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 um, um, very ancient and goes back thousands of years. Nice, nice. Yes, I love the tangent. Thank you. So, well, David, I could talk to you for all day. <laughs> And hopefully that will happen someday. But I have like uh, uh, one uh, final question for you. So where can I, our listeners connect with you? What's the best way to get in touch with you? Well, the way you connected with me was great, Raja. I mean, dude, you just reached out on LinkedIn and you said, hey, I read your book. Um, so LinkedIn is, is, is probably the social uh, media forum that I use the most versus kind of Facebook or Twitter or others. I probably should use Twitter more, but you know, just type in David Siegel uh, meetup and you find me on LinkedIn. Feel free to link in with me. And that's one. Uh, if you want to send me an email, even I'm David at meetup.com. Just send me an email and, you know, and, uh, and hopefully we can find a way to connect through that. And in terms of the book, decide and conquer, you know, it's available. The audible version, the audio version is, is I think, fantastic listening. And um, it's available on Amazon. It's available for people outside the United States that want a lower cost provider. Um, there's a site called bookdepository.com, where it's a lower cost way of free shipping, I think, uh, throughout the world. Um, and you can get it through there too. So Raja, you know, what, it worked for you, so it can work for others too. LinkedIn is great. And uh, thank you for asking that. 100%. So I'll, I'll uh, include this in the show notes, uh, the links to all these things that you just mentioned. Uh, so I, I don't have a question for you, but uh, I read about your purple hair and you wearing a yarmulke on the purple hair. Can we get a visual of that? <laughs> visual of my purple hair? Hmm, you probably can. I could, yeah, I have one of my photos. Here we go. I'm going to go to my favorites. I think I took, I put one picture, my favorites of me and my purple. Oh, here we go. I got it for you. Here we go. Let's see. Nice. <laughs> Dude, that's, that is there's, there's another one. Right after that I got my hair purple. And last one for you. That is, and with a purple sweater. That is, that yeah. is. I, I wore a lot of purple when it was really strong. And then it turned blonde when, the, when, the, when it went out. One day I'm going to make my hair, you know, meet up red, you know, once uh, something big happens. So we'll see, but you know. You got my you got my purple hair uh, picture awesome. going. Thank you. Now, you know, we have it on you know live stream. So <laughs> incredible. So when you have that red hair, come to the Austin, Texas Scotch meetup. I will. <laughs> I'll fit right in in Austin with my red hair, no <laughs> doubt. You certainly will. You certainly will. All right. Uh, let me go ahead and stop. Well, you definitely pulled out the best stuff from the book. So kudos to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. It was a very enjoyable read. So that was. I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, yeah. So I think, like I said, there's a lot for, you know, and I learned a lot today and I hope our viewers and listeners also carry a lot forward in their personal and professional life from uh, our chat. So thank you so much, David. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Namaste. Namaste to you too, David. <laughs>